वेलकम टू इंडिया स्पेशल आई एम एजाज जैदा वी आर सिक्स मंथ्स इन टू द रेवेज ऑफ कोविड नाइन्टीन एंड एटलीस्ट फोर मंथ्स सिंस द वर्ल्ड हेल्थ ऑर्गेनाइजेशन डिक्लेयर द डिजीज इज अ पेंडेमिक मैथमेटिशियंस एपिडीमियोलॉजिस्ट एंड इकोनॉमिस्ट आर गिविंग अस कर्व चार्ट टेबल्स डिबेट रेजेज ओवर फ्लैटनिंग द कर्व ऑफ फ्लैटनिंग द इकोनॉमी could it be better if there were early lockdowns could states emulate the draconian lockdown china imposed 13 cities and 60 million people put under curfew sweden's state epidemiologist anders stegnell says sweden won't lockdown he says let the maths work and we will see in 2021 whether european countries that went for a lockdown did better than sweden but then there's math that says lockdowns are important to further complicate matters the virus is acting weird and we still don't know how who it kills even initial telltale symptoms fever dry cough shortness of breath have been found to be deceptive as per the journal of the american medical association nearly 70% of the infected people who were ultimately hospitalized did not have fever there's another problem of case fatality rates it differs from one to another society Now it should be obvious that one of the central tenets of countering a threat is to understand how the threatener is going to affect the threatened. That is as true of a pathogen as of any traditional threat. Perhaps our responses will evolve as we get more information. But for now, we are dancing around the problem. Let's put the burden of explaining this on our panel of experts. We are joined by. Ms. Alana Sheikh, who is a global health consultant and focuses on health systems and their response shocks, we also have with us Professor Daria Onatmaz, who is a human immunologist at the Jackson Laboratory. Thank you to both of you. Let me begin with Professor Onatmaz here. Professor Onatmaz, we still don't know how this pathogen is killing us. Now, here's the problem. Last time when I had you on my program, we had a discussion about. it's a uh, genetic uh, you know uh, formation that it's an rna virus it does mutate but while it's unstable like all viruses are it's not shown too much mutation now if that is correct why is it that we still cannot figure out how this is killing us yeah so that's a really important question actually just uh, yesterday uh, a report came out uh, from autopsies done in the uh, US uh, that uh, many of the patients were actually dying from uh, coagulation or thrombosis you know the blockage of their arteries uh, uh, strokes um, these are not typical uh, reasons to die if from a respiratory uh, disease or infection initially it was told it was just pneumonia uh, uh de- damaging the lungs and that's causing respiratory distress and so on so uh, i think the p- uh, part of the problem is that uh we're comparing this virus to for example influenza or other respiratory uh viruses uh but this virus has much higher um so called tropism uh in other words it's able to infect many other cell types uh, other than the lung uh, tissue um so uh the, the reason why there is probably um this thrombosis or heart problems is because it might be infecting the endothelial cells the the cells that form the uh, structure of the vasculature the 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 veins and the arteries um uh, it can infect the cells in the gut in in your uh, uh intestines that's why we're seeing a lot of symptoms like diarrhea and gastrointestinal problems uh children are having some a very weird uh, uh inflammatory disease that's been recorded recently in US and Europe uh that could be because again uh this this vasculature problem uh inflammation happens uh, the response of the immune system to that so there there's all kinds of things the the brain is involved um uh and and probably there are other things that we we haven't yet understood and we don't know what's going to be the uh the long term effects of of uh, of this infection as well okay let me try and rephrase what you said uh, in order also for you to tell me if i've got you right so we have a virus which we initially thought was essentially attacking uh, the respiratory system or at least doing things that would lead to uh, respiratory failures now we suddenly find that this is a virus which is 
whose attack axes uh, is, is, are, are different. I mean, it can, like you just talked about the intestines, you talked about thrombosis. So there are multiple axes in which it can attack. And we still haven't fully understood the causal pathways uh, that would determine why it does so. I think, you know, the, the reason uh, why we thought uh, would be limited, somewhat limited to the respiratory system is because that's the entry point. So the enemy is, is entering from your nose or your throat. Um, and the idea was that it would be stopped uh, at that breach point. So that's, that's one of the first areas that the viruses and bacteria try to infiltrate into. Um, and, and in fact, you know, in some people it doesn't and it causes pneumonia. But what we didn't really appreciate is that the virus is able to disseminate throughout the body uh, and causing this multi-organ uh, effects. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, the reason we also don't know a lot is because this is a new virus that we have not seen this scale of infection before. Uh, and as the cases increase, the, the more rare conditions start to show up, uh, as well as as people unfortunately die. When you do these autopsies, you start to realize, uh, wow, you know, uh, these things uh, we, we, we've never expected. There are some young people who whose first symptoms are stroke in their brain. So they, uh, they, they can undergo paralysis, they can die, um, uh, and they don't have any other symptoms. Turns out that the virus screws up something in the brain or, or, the, or the arterial system there or vein, vein system. So, yeah, uh, I think you, you, you said it right uh, that we're still learning a lot about this virus. It it's, uh, um, turns out to be much more complex than we originally thought. Well, diabolically fascinating, I would say. Uh, stay with me, Professor Onatmaz. I have a number of other questions, but let me go to uh, Ms. Sheikh here. Ms. Sheikh, as a global health consultant, uh, now, listening to what Professor Onatmaz said and uh, lots of other reports also, as you just mentioned, the autopsies, I mentioned in my opening all the mathematical curves and charts and tables, we essentially dancing around the problem. Um, Given the, these uncertainties, decision-making, I'm assuming, is within an un environment of uncertainty. So how do governments respond to this? Because the responses are really different in terms of early lockdowns or late lockdowns, uh, then smart lockdowns, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a situation where there's two things that need to be happening for governments to make good decisions. One of which is their decisions need to be data-based. And to get the data you need, that's about exactly the examples the professor was talking about, about autopsies and learning from autopsies, about testing so that we can track the way the virus is moving. So governments need good data, and they get that data by testing and by looking at virus evolution, by looking at autopsies. And then secondly, governments need to be responsive. They need to be ready for the idea that the first decision may need to be changed. They need to be flexible and evolve their response. For example, in the United States, the initial guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Infection was to leave masks for healthcare providers. And then over time, as they realized how many people were sick without symptoms, they shifted to say everybody should wear a mask in public. So governments need to be ready to change their policies as they need to, and those policies need to come from real data, not political pressure. Okay. Now, here, uh, you're absolutely right that, uh, uh, you know, our policies need to be data-driven. But the problem here is, as I also mentioned in my opening, that one of the central principles of countering a threat is to understand how the threatener is going to affect the threatened. Now, every two weeks, we have found something that we hadn't found earlier. Now, in the process, obviously, we are also losing people. Uh, people are also getting infected. Then there is another issue of how different societies, in terms of their historical trajectories, in terms of their cultural and other mores, are going to uh, you know, respond. Because we talk about a pandemic, but it's not a homogenous thing because every society is going to respond to it in a different way. I mean, that is something that has been talked about uh, before also. So once we realize that we have a number of known unknowns, 
and to quote Donald Rumsfeld and a number of unknown unknowns, then how do we actually make that policy? The only thing that we can do is to keep tweaking something or the other uh, on the hop. There is ne never a situation where you have every piece of information you need to make a decision. Any situation, any threat, you never have all of the data. You always go into it knowing that there are things that you can't grasp and things you won't understand. So you have to move from the data that you have and you have to continue to collect it so that you can be flexible if you got it wrong. And you're certainly right that this is a global pandemic, but the responses are deeply local. One of the reasons that they think that the death rates were so high in Italy was because people lived in multi-generational households. So elderly people were living with multiple generations with younger people. That's certainly something that the countries from South Asia can look at and learn from, that they're likely to face something similar. Um, it's, it's about demographics. It's about air pollution. There's so many things that make every decision very, very local. Okay. So if we, since you talked about, so this uh, case fatality rate, this differs from one society to another. Now, we have, for instance, Iran, just west of Pakistan. And just north of Iran, in Iraq, the CFR is very low. Now, I'm not referring to the number of infected because one can argue that they don't have the testing capacity and perhaps there are a f uh, you know, the number of infected is, is much greater uh, than they have been able to figure out. But CFR is a good benchmark. We have seen the same kind of thing in Bangladesh. So this goes back to my earlier question to Professor Unatmaz, and he explained it. We really don't know how this thing is killing us. CFR isn't as reliable a benchmark as you might hope, unfortunately. And the reason for that is in many countries, deaths are not consistently recorded. Mm -hmm. or tabulated, and the cause of death isn't always effectively identified, which actually ties back to what you said, which is there are coronaviruses deaths that may not be being recorded as coronaviruses because they weren't pneumonia deaths. Like how many deaths from embolism didn't get assigned to COVID-19 because we didn't know yet that's what was causing it. Right. But then uh, there are trees that are actually uh, testing, uh, you know, the, the dead people. Uh, and, and recording those deaths as related to COVID-19. Uh, and I think that is perhaps one way of doing this. There's another issue of, uh, you know, sort of recording it uh, per million people. Uh, there is another way that it's being done is to actually see whether there's a spike in the mortality rate in terms of how many people uh, within a city would die on the average in a particular month and to see whether there's a spike and whether that spike can be attributed to COVID-19. So I agree with you that there are multiple ways of doing this. And, and uh, every way, uh, you know, neither is, is uh, none of the ways is, is foolproof. But patient load, uh, you know, and hospitals reporting a spike in mortality, I believe, are good benchmarks, no? It does tend to be a good benchmark, yes. It will catch some extra things which are attributed to COVID-19, but not necessarily related to infection. If a hospital is overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients, and that means the quality of care they're providing to other patients gets worse, you're also going to see more deaths among people who aren't infected, but were in fact largely caused by COVID-19. So that's your sort of where the data gets a little fuzzy in excess deaths. But I agree that it's a very useful uh, piece of information to have. And... Uh, we still are uh, largely groping in the dark, as I said. Uh, we get some piece of information. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, pieces of a puzzle. And we just get one or two pieces at a time. And then we're trying to put the, the bigger picture together, um, which uh, takes me back to Professor Onutmaz. Uh, Professor Onutmaz, uh, in, uh, in traditional security threats, what we try to do is that we size up the adversary. We look at uh, what he has. We look at his capabilities. And in, in purely traditional sense, it will be the number of, you know, attack aircraft and helicopters that he has, the number of tanks, you know, its training, equipment, blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm assuming, I may be wrong, that these, uh, these uh, weird ways 
in which this virus is attacking uh, various organs, that we would probably need to go to the virus itself and perhaps find out how and why it can do that? Yeah, it's interesting you, you, you mentioned that because uh, that's pretty much uh, what our immune system does as well. Uh, it has many strategies against uh, these threats, uh, viruses, bacteria, and other uh, infectious uh, organisms. Uh, now, w one thing that I think um, is a bit of a paradox, maybe, is that uh, the, while the virus is extraordinarily infectious and the mortality is very high and there's all kinds of uh, clinical symptoms that we're just appreciating. So, so as you said, there are a lot of known unknowns and maybe still unknown unknowns. But there is also the fact that uh, it turns out our immune system is able to deal with this virus when, when it can in a relatively easy manner. Uh, why am I saying this is because the virus has a very vulnerable area uh, which is basically the surface of the virus. There is this protein. It's kind of like a, a, a key that opens the lock on the surface of the cell. It binds to its receptor. And so the immune system is able to generate these um, uh, the smart uh, missiles, if you like, the antibodies uh, that can block that interaction between the, the key and the lock. And, uh, and it's able to do that in a, in a very, very successful manner because uh, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the people who have the virus either have no symptoms or have very mild symptoms, and they just don't even know that they had the virus, and the immune system is able to clear it. And in the vast majority of these people, you find these antibodies uh, that, uh, that the body uh, generates. Now, we don't know how long that will be protective, but in some ways, we kind of know uh, the weak points of the virus. We don't know all of it. Uh, so that's the approach we're taking right now in terms of the vaccines and, and, and treatments is to exploit that, that weakness of the virus, uh, utilizing the, the immune system uh, as, uh, as a sort of a um, correlative uh, aspect of it. Okay, I don't know so, if that answered you. Okay, so I, I'm just trying to understand this, um, as I'm sure uh, the viewers would also like to understand this. Now, tell me, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, and you know, where there's so many um, strange ways in which this virus is attacking, we have a number of people, as you rightly said, who are asymptomatic. And as a matter of fact, as Ms. Sheikh also pointed out, uh, one of the reasons this entire mask thing came into play, uh, even though earlier it was said that there's no point in wearing a mask, was that there's so many asymptomatic people and they might be infecting other people without even knowing. On the other hand, we have perfectly healthy young people uh, who, as you said, uh, are, are getting other symptoms, uh, you know, where the brain is getting infected and so on. Now, in terms of our inquiry into this, do we focus on the people who are badly infected and have and develop terrible multiple different types of symptoms? Or do we focus on those whose antibodies somehow have fought off this virus, perhaps without even their knowing that that has happened? I mean, what is the approach? Or do we take both approaches in order to, like a pincer movement, in order to pin down this virus? Uh, really important question. I mean, in the former case where people who are sick or who are in ICUs or who are dying, um, actually, we kind of uh, can predict uh, what the problem is. I mean, in terms of not, not from the perspective of the virus, but in terms of, the, of those human beings, because they're, they're either uh, quite old or uh, they have other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and all of these things actually make you more susceptible to infections as well. Uh, but it is a particular case in this virus. We don't know those the relatively rare cases in the young people or children, why that's happening. But, the, what you, but going back to your point, I think the latter group where people uh, who don't seem to have any problem dealing with this virus, maybe that's a much more important group to study. And in fact, in our lab, that's some of the things uh, that we are really focused on because what is it good about those people? Why is it that they don't have this problem? Why is it that their immune system or perhaps their genetic uh, uh, 
structure um, uh, does not allow the virus to spread in the body because once it does, the virus seems to have no problem. It going to pretty much anywhere in the body. It can uh, live uh, in your in your intestines. It can live in your brain or your kidneys and so on. Uh, but these people seem to be able to stop it uh, and, and fairly quickly before the virus uh, spreads to the other places. Is it the antibodies? Or is it that the immune system has other mechanisms? Uh, because, for example, there are these T cells. that are kind of like special forces. They will go and track whichever cell is infected with the virus and will kill the cell before the cell has a possibility of making more copies of the virus and spreading it. There are other mechanisms that will uh, really kind of localize, almost like the real life uh, tracking um, and testing. The immune system also does its own tracking and testing in the body. So uh, clearly is able to do that in a, in a large proportion of the people. So what are those mechanisms? Are there also genetic mechanisms? For example, some people might have less of this lock on, their, on the surface of their uh, cells. So the virus is having a more difficulty in getting in or somehow being neutralized by other mechanisms. So if you can figure those out, and I think we're beginning to do that actually, uh, the research is going incredibly fast on that front, um, then uh, we will have uh, much more uh, uh, powerful weapons to stop it, uh, both in terms of treatment and obviously developing vaccines, which is, which is directly related to. Well, you guys are the soldiers on the front, frankly, uh, if, if we are to be saved by this. But let me go back to Ms. Sheikh. Ms. Sheikh, uh, so as I said, uh, different states and societies are responding to it in different ways. So would you agree that there's no, uh, you know, one particular approach that can be recommended for everyone? that everyone has to look at how, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this pathogen is, is operating within a particular society and then decide what kind of policy to adopt. There are some goals and approaches that are going to be core to everywhere. Um, everybody needs to make sure that their healthcare providers have the protective gear they need, it, they need to give good healthcare. Everybody needs to stop the virus from spreading among the population. Everybody needs to find treatments that actually work for patients. Thank you so much. That was Ms. Sheikh speaking with us. Uh, let me, before I wrap up, go back to uh, Professor Onat Maz. Uh, Professor, uh, you know, is this uh, math that I was talking about? Uh, you know, there's a set of math that says, which talks about lockdown, and there's a set of math, as I gave the example of Sweden, which says there's no need for a lockdown. We can take certain precautions collectively, and there should be enough. Uh, which of the two approaches do you think has actually worked or is going to work? So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, as, as you also said, that given that there are many uh, uh, unknown, known unknowns or unknown unknowns, if you like, uh, that the right way to approach this problem is to uh, absolutely not to underestimate. Uh, it's okay to overestimate it uh, and really uh, uh, provide the maximum response you can give. Because what Sweden is doing, which I strongly disagree, is a, is a big gamble. Uh, so they're gambling uh, on the lives of, of many people. Um, whether or not that might work in their society, uh, because you really need the society to be uh, very much um, in tune with, with the policies and then following the rules, uh, remains to be seen. But what if it doesn't work? That's a c catastrophe. That's going to Absolutely. cost thousands and thousands of lives. So, Absolutely. But then you look around and you see uh, countries which have been very successful, uh, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, New Zealand. They have uh, less than a few cases a day. So they have uh, accomplished this by uh, performing uh, a, a very strict and rigid uh, rule sets that uh, were not only just lockdowns, but they really uh, performed huge number of tests. Um, they try to find those asymptomatic individuals before they spread, and they're still continuing to do that. They haven't let down their guard. The whole society is, is very disciplined. Everyone is wearing masks, and as if the virus is about to come back that, at any that, time. That presupposes, so we have that, those numbers. that presupposes social discipline, of course, and that is where societies differ from each other.
But thank you so much. That was Professor Deria Unatma speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss Afghanistan's situation. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special from COVID-19. We move on to the situation in Afghanistan. The U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper has said the Taliban is not, not living up to its commitments. He said violence is increasingly threatening an already fragile deal signed with Washington on 29th February. The deal called for reduced violence in a move towards talks with the Afghan government. Attacks by the Taliban have increased since then. Interestingly, Esper also said he believed the Afghan government was also not living up to its commitment. The Afghan government was not part of an agreement between the United States and the Taliban, but the deal called for Kabul to release 5,000 Taliban fighters as a confidence-building measure ahead of intra-Afghan talks. Esper said the Afghan government and the Taliban and I quote, both need to come together and make progress on the terms that are laid out, unquote. For its part, the Taliban say they have not violated the deal and that ceasefire against Afghan forces is not part of the deal until the Afghan government releases the prisoners as envisaged in the deal. Meanwhile, sources say the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghan Peace, Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad, is likely to visit Pakistan on Friday, that's tomorrow. To discuss this further, let's get to our panel. We are joined by Rahimullah Yusufzai, who is the resident editor at the News, and joins us from Peshawar. And we also have with us David S. Sidney, Senior Associate Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you to both panelists. Let me begin with David here. David, uh, Esper, interestingly, has kind of uh, you know, it's a shot across the, the bow, not just of the Taliban, but also the Kabul government. Yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, Secretary Esper is just plain wrong. There is no commitment on the part of the Afghan government for them not to be living up to, because that is one of the core weaknesses of the entire American approach to this. Uh, the United States negotiated with the Taliban. They excluded the Afghan government. And so Secretary Esper's statement that the Afghan government is not living up to its commitment is just plain wrong. Um, now, of course, the Afghan government is not doing what the United States wanted it to do, but that's different than a commitment. And that core problem that the Afghan government was not a part of these discussions is why these uh, talks that were supposed to start between the Taliban and the Afghan government have not started, why the Taliban are insisting on the release of the prisoners, uh, the whole release of the prisoners thing was not part of the original deal. It was something added in at the last minute without the permission or, or agreement of the Afghan government. Uh, so, unfortunately, I would say this is really a bungled process and bungled by the Americans. Okay. Let me take this to Raimul Abzai. Uh, Raimul Abzai, uh, David is saying that there are no commitments from the Afghan government side. Now, he's right to the extent that the Afghan government was not at the table. Uh, but there was the prisoner swap thing that was signed on to, and I think that was one of the one of the points that the Taliban were insisting on. And later, if you recall, uh, President Ashraf Ghani actually said that he's not going to do this. And then Washington leaned on him, and he agreed to do a phased, uh, you know, release of this. And Afghanistan also talked to the Taliban and said, "Well, you have to." Because the Taliban had earlier said no, nothing short of complete 5,000 prisoner release. But then they said, okay, we're going to go for the, we'll accept the phased, uh, uh, you know, release of the prisoners. So how do you read uh, Secretary Esper's uh, statement? Yes, you know, we all know, know that the Afghan government was not part of the negotiations. It was not part of the deal. But then the U.S. was, in a way, acting on behalf of the Afghan government. The U.S. has made the commitment that these prisoners would be exchanged. These are not only 5,000 Taliban prisoners who are being released. There are also 1,000 government prisoners which Taliban have to release. So it's not something which will only benefit the Taliban. Uh, 
Now the Afghan government, you know, in a way we can say that uh, they have this card in their hand and they want to use it to gain some advantage in the negotiations. So they cannot be faulted uh, for doing that because they also have to show something uh, that they have gained to their people. And uh, they are doing it uh, very, you know, in a way uh, which is uh, holding up the talks. But in a way, it's showing that they also have this power, this authority, because these prisoners are in the Afghan government's custody. But the problem is that uh, things will not move ahead until the prisoners are exchanged. If you are doing it in installments, it will not do. Taliban actually they are saying, and they have always insisted, even in during the negotiations with the Americans, uh, that this. Taliban prisoners must be released. Let me let me let me, uh, uh, let me let me stop you there, because David Sidney is actually going back to the original sin, if you will, and he says the entire process uh, has been bungled. So he is raising a question on the entire American approach of, if I have understood him correctly, and he is there, he can correct me if I am wrong. Uh, in terms of talking to the Taliban without the participation of the Kabul government is what he seems to imply. Now, my question to you, and I, I want your response to whether the Americans, once the president decided that he needs to get out of Afghanistan, whether the Americans had, in fact, another alternative to the approach that they took. Yes, I, I think that uh, David, uh, in a way, is right uh, that the U.S., uh, you know, bungled the process or uh, by not including the Afghan government in the peace talks. But the problem was that uh, Taliban were not agreeing. Uh, the U.S. was waiting, waiting and trying and trying, but Taliban never agreed to negotiate with the Afghan government at that stage. That's why the U.S. had to... Uh, do this uh, out of necessity. And that's why the, there were talks between Taliban and the U.S. Uh, this was actually the, the going to be the entry point to further negotiations. <clears throat> and that's how the approach was designed. Now, you know, if the Taliban did not want to talk to uh, the Afghan government at that stage, then what could the Americans do? <clears throat> they had to do because they wanted to leave Afghanistan. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we can always find, uh, you know, fault with these approaches, but you have to think about the other options. Was there another option? I don't think there was any other option at that stage. Military solution was out of question, and it was decided that there should be peace talks. So the peace talks had to start somehow and this was decided that the Americans would talk directly with Taliban in the hope that eventually they will agree and sit with the Afghan government and the inter-Afghan peace negotiations would begin. Absolutely. Uh, I'm also joined by Hamdullah Hamdar, uh, who is an analyst based in Kabul. Let me take this question to uh, Mr. Hamdar. Uh, Mr. Hamdar, the same question that I posed to Raimullah Yusuf Zai with reference to what David Sidney said. Once the U.S. president decided that the United States need to get out of Afghanistan, was there the possibility of another approach other than what the United States took? The U.S. had to coordinate the peace deal with the Afghan government uh, uh, before they uh, uh, started negotiation with the Taliban delegation. Uh, now that they have decided uh, and they signed the peace deal with the Taliban, Zalmay Khalilzad and his colleagues signed the peace deal with the Taliban delegation in Doha, Qatar. This deal is uh, uh, this, this deal is between the U.S. and the Taliban, and the Afghan government is technically, legally, and politically not obliged to implement any part of the deal. However, if the Afghan government is willing to cooperate and if they are showing their willingness 
to cooperate just to make sure that there will be uh, the intra-Afghan peace negotiation uh, taking place very soon, uh, then that's, uh, that, that's another point, that the Afghan government might be show, uh, showing some willingness to that. However, uh, technically, politically, and legally, the Afghan government is not obliged to implement any part of that. However, the Taliban are. The Taliban have to implement whatever they have signed with the U.S., and they have to agree to that. They have to fulfill that. And if they do not, uh, I, I guess the uh, operations against the Taliban will get escalated, and uh, the Afghan government will uh, get more power, and they will have f almost full control over the Afghan land. So Taliban are losing everything from every side, and uh, the Afghan government uh, is gaining more power, and they have, uh, uh, they have the chance or they have the option to bring more pressure on Taliban and in the, in the U.S. to agree to what the Afghan government uh, demands during the peace talks with the Taliban when the intra-Afghan peace talks starts. Okay. Now, so I'll this to David Sidney. Now, David, here's the thing. You talked about the fact that the Americans bungled it. But then the question is, what is the option? So there are certain ground realities. There's the desire uh, by the U.S. president to get out. Uh, the adversary is not prepared to negotiate with the Kabul government, uh, which they do not consider as legitimate. What other option do you think the Americans had? I think there are actually a lot of options. Uh, the statement that you made and Mr. Yousafzai made regarding the Taliban not being willing to negotiate with the Afghan government is actually not one that's been tested. Uh, the U.S. started the talks uh, almost two years ago, agreeing with the Taliban to, to have the direct talks, but there was never any really serious discussion about pulling the Afghan government in after that. Um, the US, uh, there's no evidence that the U.S. actually tried after that. Uh, so, but that's all in the past, as you said. What is the options now? I, and the options are actually narrowing. Uh, the F, the uh, current polling in the United States shows that the Trump administration has uh, about six months left. Uh, the agreement was signed not by a congressionally approved official, such as the Secretary of State or somebody who has uh, has a congressional mandate, but by Ambassador Halazad, who's actually a fairly low-ranking person in the U.S. system because he was not confirmed by the U.S. Congress. So the staying power of this deal from the U.S. side has to have a lot of questions by everybody here. Um, and so there is, it's not just the issue that the president of the United States, the current president of the United States wants to leave Afghanistan quickly and, and he's giving his negotiators no room. I think if you look at it from a broader perspective, this is a bungled process that's under a lot of time pressure. And uh, I don't think that uh, the likelihood of a quick peace is very high now. And I think it really needs some really strong intervention by other countries besides the United States. I know that Ambassador Halazad is visiting not just Pakistan, he's going to be visiting India. Um, the other countries, such as Germany, uh, uh, have played a role. Russia and China have an interest here. I think there's really an opening now for other countries to play a role to try and bring peace to Afghanistan, particularly in the situation. You mentioned it once, but it's really overwhelming here in Kabul right now. The, everything uh, dealing with this COVID thing is affecting everybody. The actual numbers that you're hearing uh, from the uh, in the press are much lower than the real numbers. Yeah, uh, because the, the testing that... capacity is very low. If you if you actually go for aggressive testing, the numbers are going to rise. Uh, that's all the time uh, we have for uh, this segment today. Thank you so much, Hamdullah Hamdad, Rahimullah Yusuf Zaid, David Sidney. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. For latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.